Thanks, Thank Sarah. You. Sounds like it's not quite the agenda, but it would be interesting to hear Michael Dukakis speculate about yeah. Super Tuesdays of the past. the answers, yeah. Certainly by next Tuesday and if I'm organized before that. sheet that came around, um, you'll see that there's some practice problems on there, problems in Dixit and Skeeth and uh, some variations on problems you've already done. There's actually quite a bit of uh, practice uh, available on the study sheet and I will be posting answers for all of those problems on the course website at least by next Tuesday, probably earlier. Um, other midterm related announcements. For the midterm, you will need to bring a blue book, okay? No notes or books or anything like that on the midterm. You can bring a calculator if you want. You're not going to need a calculator, okay? Um, if, unless it's, you know, brings you good luck or something <laughs> like that. Uh, it's fine to express your answers as fractions, um, but no, no elaborate calculations needed. Uh, one large blue book should be fine. Some of you will be taking the exam in another room. I'm working on that right now. That is proving harder to do than it's been in the past. Um, it's not looking likely that you're going to have a lot of space to spread out during the midterm. What I asked for was either a really big room or another room this size so you guys could uh, have a little more elbow room than you have right now. What I'm hearing from the registrar is that that's not available, um, but I may have one or two sections go to another room because I actually think when everybody who is enrolled in the class is in the room, there wouldn't be enough seats here. So I will, when I get that settled with the scheduling people, I will email everybody in the class, I'll put it on the course website, and I'll make an announcement about Tuesday, about it on Tuesday. I guess one other thing about the midterm, looking ahead, um, I've said this to some of you, I, I don't remember if I've said it to the whole class or not, but it probably bears repeating. Um, you want to be prepared on the midterm for some time pressure, okay? I don't, I, my ideal would be to have a test where uh, time wasn't an issue. It's hard to do that in the amount of time that we have. It used to be really hard when I taught this class in the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 50-minute uh, format. Even with an hour and 15 minutes, in order me to, for me to ask you enough questions for you to show me that you've learned what you need to, uh, time's going to be a little tight on the midterm. Okay? I'm saying that now definitely not to make you nervous. I hope what, what I'm trying to do is to prepare you for that. One thing you can do, especially if in general you're not comfortable working under time pressure, is to start practicing. Okay? Do some of those um, practice problems on the clock. Make up practice variations from your homework and do it with the clock running um, so that you're, you, you practice that kind of focus. Another thing that I just can't emphasize enough is the midterm and the final exam are exams where you are better off 
doing something on all of the questions than getting one question perfect and leaving some blank. Okay, so my advice to everybody is to try to work through the whole midterm, then go back and check your work. If you work and check um, and you run out of time, you'll be in worse shape than if you work, run out of time, aren't able to check. Okay, so it's that kind of test where you're better off doing your first cut on everything and then using whatever time you have left to um, dot the I's and cross the T's. Okay. The other thing I'll say about time pressure is it's not so much of an issue on the final exam, okay? It's always a problem with the midterm. Just be prepared for it. Don't freak out about it. Just do your best. <coughs> Everybody's going to be under time pressure. And know that on the final exam, most people finish. The people who are still writing at the end of three hours on my final exams, I'm convinced would be there if they had six hours to do it. You know, some people just cannot turn in a test early, okay? So... Uh, that's uh, just some thoughts on how to best prepare for the, for the midterm. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to go right back into the decision tree that I started on at the end of class on Tuesday. And that was, I was going down memory lane there and telling you about a decision I faced, not in my life as a political scientist or a UCLA professor, but in my life as a mom, and was I going to allow or forbid my kid to stand up on his sled when he was sledding with his cousins in Colorado. And I started to set up this decision as a tree. Now I want to reiterate the difference between a decision and a game. A decision tree and a game tree is just that a decision tree has only one decision maker in it. Okay? You could imagine a variation of the story that would have multiple players strategizing and that wasn't the way it was actually and I think I can uh, capture the situation pretty well just as a decision. So the nodes are going to be my decisions and nature nodes that represent my uncertainty, okay? So if I tell my son, no, don't do that, either sit on your sled or you're out of there, that's going to be my baseline payoff, okay? Zero, zero. If I allow him to do that, that's the risky move. That's the move where I don't know what's going to happen, okay? And just as we do in games and decisions, we represent places where we don't know what's going to happen with a nature node. Yes? I did that same thing last time, didn't I? That's a mistake. Thank you. 11, 12, and I'm doing that. This is going to be quite a class, I'm afraid. Okay. So, what's your name? Sasha. Sasha's saying, why are there two zeros? There should not be two zeros here. There are two zeros when there are games and there are two players. There is one zero. And maybe if I write it in red, it'll help me remember it, okay? Only one payoff in a decision tree because there is only one player, okay? So that's true for me. It's true for you in the first problem on your homework this week where you have a decision to model. Only one payoff there. <coughs> All right, so let's hopefully stay off autopilot for a little bit, keep the zero there. The uncertainty then is about my payoff based on whether if I allow the reckless behavior there's a crash or not. Okay, and the numbers that I picked somewhat arbitrarily but also somewhat reflectively to capture my preferences was that a serious crash would be a payoff of negative 10, but allowing him to do something really fun, it's hard to do in Los Angeles, would be worth 5. Okay, so these are my payoffs. As I always do with nature nodes, I have to assign probabilities. Okay, in this case, I'm going to use a variable to represent the probabilities. I'm going to say, I don't know what the probability of a crash is. OK, 
Okay. One way you could think about this is that the actual probability of a crash is going to vary from kid to kid. Okay. So it's going to depend on is my son a good athlete? Is this a really dangerous hill? What's the snow like? Um, those would be sort of the main factors that would determine what specific number P is going to have. I'm going to represent it as a variable here because when I represent it as a variable, there's a question that I can ask. Okay, and it was the question I left you guys with. How high can P, P is the probability of a crash, be before the optimal decision, optimal decision from my, my point of view, is to allow. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to solve this right now. You solve nature nodes in a decision tree the same way you solve them as a game tree. Okay. You solve decision trees just like game trees from the bottom up. You replace nature nodes with the expected value associated with that choice. Okay? So the expected value to me, I'm just going to abbreviate value with a V here, of allowing the reckless behavior is P, the probability that the kid crashes, <laughs> times how low my utility is if he crashes, okay? Plus the probability that it's just fine, no crash happens, everybody has a truly hilarious time, and the payoff associated with that, okay? So let's simplify that. I get negative 10p distributing the 5 plus 5 minus 5p. It looks like I get 5p minus 10. That is the expected value here. I'm going to just, it's 15, right? 15, thank you. Negative 10p. And so that whole thing is, let's just not add stuff here. This line I did right, right? Negative 10p plus 5 minus 5p. Okay, good. So I get 5 minus 15p. Yeah, okay. You guys are good. You're keeping me on the straight and narrow. And this, the expected value of allowing the behavior, is what goes up here for the nature node. Okay, so let me diligently copy exactly what I'm supposed to here. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this is my expected value of allowing the standing up. And then the answer to this question is, how high can P be before 5 minus 5? How, can, how high can P be before 5 minus 5P, the probability of allowing, is greater than 0? Okay? So when this is true, right, this is the expected value of allowing. This is the known value of forbidding. When this is true, optimal choice is allow. Okay. So we can just solve this. I'll take the 15p over there. I get 5 greater than 15p. It looks like as long as p is less than 1 third, the right choice is to allow the standing up. Okay. So whenever conditions, kid, the whole thing are such that the probability of a bad crash is one third or less, then I'm okay with allowing him. I'm doing the right thing by allowing my son to do this. Yes, Lillian. Lillian's saying, what about when P is exactly equal to one-third? When P is exactly equal to one-third, it means I'm truly indifferent. 
Okay, the good possibility is ex of just having fun and not crashing is exactly balancing the bad possibility of crashing, taking into account how likely they are. And Lillian went on to say is, do you just not know what to do? And I think that's the right interpretation of being indifferent here. Another way to say the same thing would be neither choice would be wrong in that case. Neither choice would be a mistake. Neither choice would lead me to have systematic regrets. Okay. Um, in yet another thing we could think about there that we are going to start considering um, when we get past the midterm is it wouldn't be wrong in that case to flip a, for me to flip a coin. Okay. Just because I don't care. Okay. In any other case, I wouldn't do it. I'd really be thinking, okay, what should I do? What shouldn't I do? Okay. All right, well, I use this example. Um, I bet probably not many people in this class who look like they have kids themselves, except for June in the back, and his kids aren't quite uh, at the state level yet where they're challenging him in this way. But I, some of you guys probably relate to this kind of story from the other perspective. Um, your parents have uh, had to make these kinds of decisions for you. I picked it because it's a good decision, at least it's a vivid one in my mind, for illustrating the idea of an ex post mistake. Okay, that's something you're asked about in your first question on the homework, and I didn't get a chance to talk about that on, um, on Tuesday. Uh, the question came up on the bulletin board, and Flory, one of our TAs, gave, I thought, a very good, succinct answer to what's an ex post mistake? It's a mistake that you don't see, okay, or that you can't understand, that isn't obvious until the game, or in this case, the decision, the game is over, okay? Okay, so this really did happen on January 2nd. I would say I was in Colorado, my son's sledding away, and I think the probability, as I'm standing there on that sunny morning in Longmont, the probability of him having the crash was substantially less than one-third. Okay, probably more like five out of 100 or something. It wasn't that big of a hill. My son's pretty coordinated. Nonetheless, he did have a crash. Okay, and that's the point that I want to make here. I made the right choice. Next year, we're at that same hill. He's doing the same thing. I'll probably make the same choice again, even though he did crash, break his shoulder all day in the emergency room. It was bad, okay? But it was not an ex ante mistake. It was bad that it worked out that way, but like I'm a good mom. I didn't make a stupid choice there. It was an unlucky choice, okay? So you're, you're laughing, but this happens, right? Sometimes you make the right choice. You use all the information available to you. You're really thinking, okay, I'm weighing the pluses and minuses. I'm thinking how likely they are. I'm conscientious here, and I'm making a choice that is, I'm going to juxtapose. Ex ante correct. Okay, ex ante and ex post are just Latin phrases for before the fact and after the fact. Before I knew how that day was going to unfold, my choice to allow the standing up on the sled was correct. Okay, my expected utility, which in lots of ways is incorporating my son's expected utility, his cousins, my dad's, everybody involved there, my expected utility was higher from that option. I got unlucky. We all got unlucky that day, okay? So it was ex ante the right choice to do, okay? A choice is ex ante correct if it is the best choice given the information at the time of the decision. It could still be an ex post mistake. 
Okay, you can still have that feeling of, ah, if I'd only known, I would have made the other choice. I certainly that morning wished that I had forbidden the activity. Okay. Whenever you make a choice under uncertainty, whenever you make a choice where you're not quite sure what the consequences will be, if, those, if that thing you're uncertain about actually matters, okay, so that if it works out one way, you choose one thing, and if it works out another way, you choose the other, there's always going to be the possibility of an ex post mistake. Okay? When you make a choice and you're not sure about what the final consequences are going to be, there's always a possibility that you can do the best you can. You can choose the highest expected utility, and things are still going to work out badly. Okay? You'll never get rid of an ex post mistake. If you're using decision theory or game theory, you're not going to make ex-ante mistakes. Okay? So an ex-ante mistake in this game, given the, that p was less than uh, one-third, would have been to forbid it. Okay? That would have been, uh, I would have, I'm sure, been accused by many generations of my family of being way too uptight not making the right decision, and they would have been right. Okay, really, it was not an unreasonable thing to allow. Okay, all right. So, two other things I want to say. One about ex post mistakes, and um, one about probabilities in general. <coughs> okay, so. Let's see, I'm gonna get rid of this. Stepping back to the big picture again and just what we are representing with uh, nature nodes and the probabilities here. These probabilities are parameters of the game. Okay, just like when we use variables in the payoff, they're parameters of the game. So what I'm really representing, in this case a decision, what I'm really representing here is a whole family of decisions that are of the same structure, in this case the same payoffs, they just vary um, in the value of P. Okay, so a whole set of scenarios that involve a possibility of a crash or not. Okay. What I'm doing here is I'm analyzing a whole bunch of sledding decisions that could occur here for different probabilities. Okay? So saying that the probability of a crash is P, let me say that differently. If I say that P equals, I'm going to pick a different value now. If I say that P equals 0.5, I'm saying something about a very specific situation, okay? A specific kid, a specific slope, a specific kind of foolish behavior, okay? I can use the same tree with the variable to think about a much worse case, okay? So P equals 0.95. Um, now the thing I'm allowing is standing up on the sled juggling an axe while you, slow down, while you slide down or something like that. Okay, much, much higher likelihood there that we're going to have a crash. And in this case, with this probability, the optimal decision is to forbid. No, put the axe back in the car. We're not doing that. Okay, this is the optimal ex ante correct decision. Okay. This, and yeah, this is the decision I would make. I uh, wouldn't have to draw a tree for that one. What's the probability of an ex post mistake in this case? Any thoughts? How many think um, the probability of an ex post mistake is um, zero? Oh, you're not going for it. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. It's, it's reasonable to think that it's zero. Okay. It's not, though. There, there is a, what would an ex post mistake be here? It's, 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 it's hard, much harder to see in this scenario. 
Okay. My optimal choice here is to forbid it. Okay. I could be wrong, right? The probability that we have a bad accident doing the silly thing with the axle while we're sliding down the hill is 0.95, but there's that other 0 0.05 probability that we get down to the hill and the axe is still spinning around, nobody's hurt, and what a rush that would be. Okay? That would be the ex post mistake. Okay? So in this scenario, there's still the possibility of an ex post mistake, but Kyra was, was thinking it wouldn't be there. I think your intuition is we'd never see it. Right? We wouldn't know. Okay? If I say, no, you're not doing this risky thing, we'll never know whether the ex post mistake would have occurred. We'll never know whether my son would have been so lucky that he could have done this really outrageously dangerous thing and gotten away from it. Okay? So we still have the probability of an ex post mistake. It's there. It's is 0.05, but we will never know if it occurred. Okay. This mistake I knew all too well. Okay. Elaine, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Is the mistake not necessarily a bad thing, but just an unforeseen event? Yeah. It's a, Elaine's saying the mistake is the unforeseen event. Okay. It's unforeseen event is maybe a little too much because in either case we are foreseeing the event. We're foreseeing that it's possible, but we're thinking either that it's too unlikely or too unappealing. So both those things go into the expected utility, how good or bad the thing is and how likely it is. It's the, the scenario that's not governing our choice. That's the one that happens. Okay, So you could always... Whenever you're making a choice under uncertainty, it's always possible that that choice will be wrong. Sometimes it will be wrong in ways that you will be very aware of and you will have clear ex post regrets. But there are other cases where you won't be called on your ex post mistake, but it's still possible that it's there. The probability could be higher than when you do all the math and whatever, the probability could be higher than what the baseline is or what the baseline is. It's not always the um the <laughs> higher probability that goes with the choice that we make. Um for example, in this case, um let's say that the probability is four tenths, okay? So the probability is four tenths of a bad crash. It's not less than one third, okay? It's, it's greater than one third, okay? Um, I would forbid him to do that. He would, I'm sure, if he was so uh, empowered with decision theory that he could do that, he would say, but mom, I'm more likely to not have a crash than I am, okay? The reason why I would still go with the decision that corresponds to the lower probability is because the consequences are so bad. Okay. The question is, would it always be safer to choose the higher baseline probability? No. Only when the two events are sort of equally good or equally bad. Okay. And that's, that's actually the reason why we go through the expected utility calculation, because we don't want to just choose the, more, the decision that goes with the more likely event. We also want to think about, is it a really bad consequence here or a really minor consequence? So where your intuition would be right is if the difference between uh, forbidding and... Uh, the good outcome here and the bad outcome were the same. So if I had a minus 5 here, that would give me uh, 1 half as my cut point there. Okay. okay. Another thing I want to emphasize about this, this is kind of stepping back for a minute, but it's really, really important here. Uh, really, really important. So I'm going to write it over here in my space for really important things. 
whenever you have problems that have probabilities in them. And so right now, we're having probabilities um, to deal with uncertainty um, about outcomes. We're going to use probabilities for different things in the course. Remember that probabilities, they're not just any number. Okay. One thing about them is that they must be, I'll say non-negative, because a probability can be zero. Okay. And they must add up to one. Okay. This fact about probabilities, that if we're considering all the things that happen, the probabilities that attach to those events have to add up to one. This helps us a lot. Okay? We relied on it here. Once I said the probability of crashing was p, I knew what the probability of not crashing was. Once I said if the probability of having a crash is 40%, I know that the probability of not crashing is 60%. Okay? That, that is an important fact about probabilities. If your probabilities add up to a number that's less than 1, it means there's something that can happen that you don't yet have in the tree. Okay? So you need to fix that, either by fixing the probabilities so they do add up to 1, or adding in the outcome that's missing there. Okay? If they add up to more than 1, you've got too much stuff there, either too much probability or too many events. Okay? So they have to add up to exactly 1. So in the cases, I think every case that we're going to look at in this class is going to be a case where either one thing can happen or another thing. Okay? Uh, it's not that hard to think about multiple possibilities here, but we don't need to do it. In this class, we're just going to think about probabilities either being one way or another. And what that means is if we have just two possibilities, if we know the possibility of one, then we can figure out the possibility of the other. Yeah? When you say an ex post mistake is a mistake that you don't see until the game is over, do you mean see in the sense that you don't foresee it or you don't see it happen? Uh, the question is do you, an ex post mistake is a mistake you don't see till the end of the game. Is it something you don't foresee or you don't see it happen? I would say you don't see it happen. Okay? So again, this, going back to my case, the fairly low probability of a crash, my um, expected utility from allowing being higher than it would be from forbidding. It wasn't that I didn't foresee the possibility of a mistake. Okay? I definitely was watching and the possibility was flashing before my eyes. So I, I foresaw that it could happen, but I didn't know that it would happen. Okay? So the ex post mistake is the thing that actually does happen that makes you wish you'd done the other thing. Okay? Wished you'd forbidden the behavior when it started. But what makes it just an ex post mistake, just a mistake that you see after the fact, is it wouldn't change the way you'd make the decision if you had to do it over again with what you knew at the time. Okay? So again, an ex post mistake is unavoidable. An ex ante mistake means you really did something wrong. Okay? It means that you really didn't think about what the probabilities were, didn't balance the utilities correctly, that you weren't making the optimal choice. Okay? So an ex ante mistake is one where, ah, oh, if you had to do it over again, you'd do it differently. An ex post mistake is if you had to do it over again with the same amount of information, You'd allow you'd make the same make the same choice. Okay. All right. So we are going to go back now to the rich country, poor country, riot, no riot scenario, and um, do some of the same analysis and some different stuff as well. As I'm erasing, let me just emphasize again, what I'm erasing here was a decision, just one person's playoff, payoff. The reason is that only one person's choice mattered there. All right.
have the rich government here that can send aid or not. Um, now we're back in the world of game theory where we have two different governments strategically interacting, so we need to have a payoff for each when they when the rich government doesn't send A, the poor government doesn't have a choice, payoffs are just zero, zero. If the rich government does send A, the poor government gets to decide what to do with it. Education, limousines. If the poor government spends it on education, that gives us a payoff of 2-2. Two, two. That's a nice payoff, better for both players than if the rich government doesn't send aid. If the poor government spends its on, aid money on limos, then nature has a move, and nature decides whether there's a riot or not. Okay. Saying that without the jargon of game theory, if the poor government chooses the limousines, we don't know what the outcome will be. Okay. One possibility is that the poor government will just get the limousines, there's not going to be any reaction among the population, and the set of payoffs that are associated with that are minus two for the rich government who's humiliated and annoyed with the poor, poor government and a payoff of five for the poor government who's enjoying their limousines. But the other possibility is that there really is a riot and if that's the case, the rich government's payoff is still the same. Okay? The rich government does, gets minus two if its aid money is squandered regardless of what's happening um, in the streets here, but now the poor government's payoff is also low from a riot. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, if there's a riot, we have a low payoff for the poor government. Okay, so having your limousines and having a riot is the worst possible thing here for the poor government. Um, worse than not getting the aid in the first place here. Ha Spending the aid money on limousines and not having a riot is the best thing in this game from the poor government's point of view. Okay. Okay, so we did this um, on Tuesday. I'm not going to rewrite it in, I'm just going to summarize. On Tuesday, we looked at the probability of a riot being 50%. Okay? It's just as likely that we have one as we don't. Now, as I'm writing up that up there, I'm realizing something's left out of my game tree. What did I leave out of my game tree? The probabilities. Okay? Remember, when we add a nature node, we don't need to add payoffs. Nature's not getting a payoff here, but the nature nodes are solved by expected values which involve probabilities. Okay, so those probabilities tell us, um, the probabilities give us the ability to make the best use of what we know about the likelihood of a riot or not. Okay, so before we looked at probabilities of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 either place, what I want to do now is change that. Okay, so now let's let the probability of a riot be 0.25. So what's the probability of no riot? 0.75. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And let's just do a little example here. Solve it with that. Before I do that, let's remind ourselves what happened with the probability of the riot on Tuesday, a different probability, so a different game. Same in every aspect of the structure except for the probabilities. In that case, the um, rollback equilibrium was aid and education if aid. Okay, so that was a, I thought that was a nice uh, equilibrium. It was uh, uh, nothing else Pareto efficient. Now, switching to red for the new probabilities, I'm going to solve it the same way. I'm going to replace the nature node with its expected value for each player. Okay. Last time I asserted that um, 
if you plug these numbers into the expected value format, you'd get the answer that made sense, even though in this case, um, there isn't really any uncertainty about the rich government's payoff. You don't need to calculate an expected value for the rich government, but let's say you're under time pressure, you're just working, will you get the wrong answer? No, you won't, okay? If you have, I'm going to switch to fractions, it's just easier for me to um, do the multiplying, and you guys are going to watch me like a hawk, make sure that I'm doing my uh, algebra on the board correctly. Okay, so for the rich government, with probability one-fourth, my payoff is negative two, right? Plus probability three-fourths, my payoff is negative two. I'm going to leave some space here to do the poor government, and I'm going to finish solving this. Negative two over four plus negative six over four sounds like negative eight over four sounds like negative two. Okay, so let's just do negative two minus six over four. That is indeed negative eight, negative two. Okay, so this is just. I'm going to put expected in quotes because we don't need to calculate the expected value of the rich player's payoff. If these numbers were different, then we wouldn't have a choice. Okay. okay, so for the poor government, using the same formula with probability one-fourth, there'll be a riot, they'll also get this payoff of negative two with probability three-fourths, There'll be no riot, they'll get a payoff of five. Okay, so again, just kind of bringing down line by line. Simplifying here, I'll get negative two plus 15 over four. 13 fourths, that sounds like three and a quarter. So like three and a quarter to you guys? I think it does, okay. So here is the expected payoff of the poor. Okay. Just doing my calculations here in bitter detail. What I've done now is I've solved the nature node by replacing the nature node with its expected payoffs. Okay, so expected payoffs of negative 2 and 3.25. Okay. So I've rolled up this part of the tree. Now I'm continuing with my backward induction process, continuing to solve from the bottom up. Okay, so now if I get to this node and I'm the poor government, what's my choice going to be? Limo. Okay, yeah? A riot can happen. I'm balancing the fact that a riot can happen and that it gives me a bad payoff if it does, but the fact is it's more likely not to happen and my payoff is really good if it doesn't pay it. So my ex ante correct choice, if I'm the poor government, um, strategically speaking, not ethically speaking, is to take that aid money and buy the limos. Okay? So now this expected payoff comes up here to be the strategic equivalent. Okay? So that's a little bit you know, different than what we were doing in games without uncertainty, but it doesn't matter whether what we replace this nature node with is expected playoffs from a nature node or an optimal choice from a decision node. Whatever we've replaced it with just bubbles right back up to the game. Okay, so the strategic equivalent to the rich government of sending aid is a payoff of negative two. Okay, what's the rich government going to do? Not send aid. So when the probability of a riot is a little bit lower, p equal 0.25, now the rollback equilibrium is no aid and limo if aid. So in one sense, the nature node changes the game, but lots, lots of things don't change. Okay, the rollback equilibrium still just has a strategy for each player. The fact that there's a nature node, you wouldn't know that just from looking at the rollback equilibrium. Okay, it doesn't show up in the equilibrium at all. 
Right? Strategies are the, the <coughs> same here. And the idea is even the same. Okay? The idea is that even though neither the rich government nor the poor government know what would really happen if the poor government buys the limousines, the rich government knows what the poor government thinks about it. The rich government can anticipate how the poor government is going to make this choice even though the poor government is uncertain about the consequences. Okay? So that's why the rich government is able to anticipate the poor government's choice. The, poor, the rich government can say, that poor government, those guys may be corrupt, but they can do their expected values. They're going to buy the limousines. I'm saving my aid money. Okay. Okay. Now in a game, just, uh, let me just say one thing and I'll get your question. In a game, we can actually think about an ex post mistake for both players. Okay. Kyra. For this whole game, p equals 0.25. So what I'm doing here is I'm contrasting the game that we did on Tuesday that had probabilities of 0.5 here and here. And I didn't redo that, but that was kind of the main thing we did on Tuesday. We found the rollback equilibrium there. Um, and this was sort of a, one way that I was trying to answer your question about punishment, okay? That with this 50% chance of punishment in the form of uncertain consequences here, we got this rollback equilibrium. And so today's choice is different. And maybe let me use a different color here. The only difference here, the only difference is the probability of a riot. Okay? So everything else is staying the same. Okay. So with these numbers, the red probabilities here, the today's probabilities, what would be the probability of an ex post mistake? can pick any one. And actually, in one second, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the, the question that I asked about the sledding example. Okay? I can pick any probability I want, but rather than just picking and choosing, actually, I think maybe I'll go ahead and do that, and then we'll talk about the ex post mistake again. Okay? So what you're thinking is, do we have to pick each probability? No. This is where we can use a variable. Okay? So let me erase the red, and I'm going to erase the probabilities. We'll let p be a variable, and then for all values of p, we'll be able to say, for these values, the equilibrium will be that one. For the other values, it'll be a different one. Okay, so let's, let me erase, and we'll, we'll go through that logic right now. The green is going to be how does the equilibrium, how does what we predict about what's going to happen in this game depend on P, okay? We've seen that if we pick one value, we get a good equilibrium, the rich country sends aid, and the poor gun print poor country does what the rich country was hoping to do, hoping it would do with it, but if we pick a different value, the equilibrium changes. Let's think about P as a variable to see how high the probability of a riot has to be in order to keep the poor government from squandering the money on limousines. Okay? 
So just as I did before, once I write down P over here, I know what I have to write over there. Okay, if it's, this is P, the other one is 1 minus P. Okay. So now when I do my expected payoffs here, um, I'm going to remember that no matter what P is, the um, minus, the expected value here is going to be minus 2. It's the same under either scenario. Okay. But I'm going to calculate the expected payoff of the poor government because it really is going to depend on P. It's going to be different for different values of P. Okay. So I'm going to get negative 2 times P plus 5 times 1 minus P. Okay. Again, you guys are watching me like hawks on this, right? Simplifying this, I get negative 2p plus 5 minus 5p. That sounds like 5 minus 7p. Everybody okay with that? Looks pretty good. Okay. So now what's the poor government going to do if it gets aid? The answer is, um, is a, sometimes you'll hear people say the first law of social science is sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's that way. And that's the answer here. What the poor government's going to do depends. We're going to have to do cases. Okay? We're going to have to think about whether 5 minus 7p is greater than 2 or less than 2. Okay? So going along here in solving the gain, bring down this board, with P now as a variable, we have case 1, let's say case 1 is the case where 2 is greater than 5 minus 7P. Okay, what do we do in this case for the poor government? We do aid. Okay. In this case, what I get from spending that aid money on education too is bigger than what I get on expectation, on average, from spending it on limousines. So the optimal choice is education. We phrased our question, and it's sort of naturally it seems natural to think of this in terms of P, so let's just rearrange that inequality to make it be an expression about P. Okay, so I'll just swap the sides of the negative 7P and 2. So I'll get 7P greater than 3 as long as P is greater than 3 sevenths. Poor should choose education at, we'll call it node 2. I haven't been numbering my nodes, but let's do that right now. 1 and 2. Okay. Case 2 is, well, actually, let's finish case 1. That's the way I've normally been doing it. If the poor chooses education at node 2, the rich government can anticipate that the poor is going to choose education at node 2. What's the rich government going to do? Send aid. Okay. Right. Now I'm done. Okay. So for one case, um, started in green, maybe I'll call this the blue case okay, here. Okay. So let case one be the blue case here, where this is true, okay, where this is less than that, okay, 2 is greater than this, just saying the same thing, then the equilibrium path is for the poor to choose education here, the rich to choose aid. That's a happy outcome. The other case, I'll just write the whole thing here in uh, red. 
It's just the reverse. Okay, now if 2 is less than 5 minus 7p, now the choice is going to be limousines, right? Okay, it's just the flip side here. If this number is less than that one, the poor's optimal choice is going to be limousines. The strategic equivalent here will be negative 2, 5, whereas in the blue case it was 2, 2. And the rich government's optimal choice is going to be not. Limousines at node 2, not at node 1. Okay. So what we've done now is we've solved this game for every possible value of p. We'll do the answer here in black. Whenever the probability of a riot is less than 3 sevenths, okay, the rollback equilibrium is no aid and limo if aid, okay, for a probability of riots greater than three sevenths, the rollback equilibrium is aid and education if aid. So now we didn't have to put p equal 0.75 in there to answer your question. Now all we have to do is say, OK, well, 0.75 is greater than 3 sevenths. So we know that that high probability of a riot is um, going to be enough to get us into what we would think of as usually a good equilibrium, okay, an equilibrium where aid is sent and where it's spent in the manner intended. Yes? Um, how do we know what the strategic equivalent will be, negative 2, negative 2, or negative 2, 5? Were those the things you were asking? Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, I was not seeing what your problem is, and you, you saw a mistake here, okay? What, what's your name? Joyce. Joyce. I'm sorry, I'm sometimes, ask, sometimes asking names and sometimes not and remembering some of what I'm told and not others. Um, doing the best I can here. Joyce is looking at this and she's looking at my strategic equivalent here and wondering how I got that. Okay, that's not the strategic equivalent. Okay, very good that that didn't look right to you. What is the strategic equivalent in this state, in this The negative 2 is right, and I think that's maybe why I didn't catch it, because the negative 2 is all I needed to know what the rich government should do. This is really not the strategic equivalent. The strategic equivalent here is this. It's what we think will happen at this node. Okay? So the correct strategic equivalent here is negative 2, 5 minus 7p. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? So the general thing here, when you are calculating a strategic equivalent of a decision node where you've done some expected values already lower down in the game, those expected values bubble up in the strategic equivalent. Okay? It's different than if this had been a decision node and the actual payoffs would bubble up. Okay? So again, let me emphasize here what's going on, we have the expected payoffs from the nature <laughs> node in the strategic equivalent. Yes? What, what's your name? Tiffany. Tiffany's question is, why don't we 
color in the branches that are shooting off of the nature node? That's a very good question. Let's think about what we mean when we color the branches. What I'm doing is I'm highlighting the path that the decision maker is going to choose. So when I color a branch, what I'm doing is I am looking at the payoffs of the person who controls the branch and comparing them. Okay, so I colored blue over here because in the blue case, the poor government's payoff is higher. Nature is never going to make a decision. Okay, so it's one of those things that we do differently with nature nodes than we do with decision nodes. Because nature's not making a decision, we're just leaving this ambiguous. When we replace the nature node with the expected value, the expected value has parts of both branch in it. That's why we can never say it's going to be this way or the other until the game actually runs. And then sometimes we see what happens and sometimes we don't. Okay. Actually, in this game, the way I've got it set up here, we would never see what would happen here, right? Either we'd be in the case where the rich government sends aid and the poor government is so worried about the riots that they spend it on education. Okay, that's one possibility that could happen. Or we're in the situation where the poor government wouldn't look at it this way. They take the risk, but the rich government would not. Okay, so here's a case in this game where we'll never find out whether the riots would actually happen or not. The riots would always be off the equilibrium path here. Okay. Now there could still be ex post mistakes. We could have those kind of sneaky ex post mistakes that we'll never know about. Like maybe I should let my son juggle the axes while he's sledding. Maybe when the rich government sends aid, the poor government spends it on education, maybe they're paranoid. Maybe they could have those limousines, and there wouldn't be a riot after all. They'll never know. Okay? And the probability of the ex post mistake in this particular case is the probability that there wouldn't be a riot. Okay, it's 1 minus p. Um, can I repeat what I said? I try re rewinding my uh, script here. The I'm trying to remember where we started here. Okay, when the poor government chooses education, okay, say so they choose education because p the probability of the riot is a half. That was the case that we were thinking of before. They're choosing education. We'll never know if there would have been a riot or not, but the probability of one was only 50%. It means 50% probability there wouldn't have been one. Okay? So there's still a 50% in that case probability of uh, an ex post mistake. Okay? There's a 50% probability that if the poor government would have known what would happen, if it had done limousines, it would have chosen to do it, but it was just so worried that it didn't. Okay. Okay. So what I've done so far, um, I've noticed this pattern that whenever I say I have just five minutes left and I have just enough to tell you in five minutes, I'm never able to finish what I think I do in five minutes. So today I'm not even going to go down that path, although that could be an ex post mistake right there. I'll never know and neither will you. Today might have been my day. Um, but it's, it's actually it's a pretty good stopping place. I do have one more topic that I'm going to cover about um, uncertainty. This is uncertainty about the preferences of, uh, of a player in the game. It's something you'll need to know for the final exam. You don't need to know it for the midterm. Okay, so the midterm is going to cover up to this point. Okay. And we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>